Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the mistakes we made, all the stuff we left out, and all the Germanys we franced. I'm Robert Rath. I'm the head writer of Extra History, and we're here to talk about the third century crisis, a really fun set of episodes to write. Uh, I appreciated being able to be a little bit sillier. Rome is far enough uh, behind us that you can afford to be a little bit flip about some of the more horrible things. Uh, like emperor after emperor just murdering each other. So let's just jump into it. Our recommended reading is a lot of recommended listening. Uh, the ongoing global pandemic is, makes it very difficult for me to get to the library. Uh, impossible, really. And for a while, airmail between the US and Hong Kong uh, went down, so I couldn't order books and have them arrive in time. So I did a lot of digital resources again this time. So you hear a lot of great courses and podcasts and things like that. The first one, there's these are two separate great courses, uh, all, both by Garrett G. Fagan, The Emperors of Rome and The History of Ancient Rome. Excellent resources. Uh, he's a, a very entertaining person to listen to. I recommend them. Uh, I also used a couple of Osprey books, Rome's Enemies 5 by David McColl and Andy McBride. This is going to give you all the Palmyra uh, Zenobia stuff that you want and have a, some excellent, we have... Zenobia back here from from the book. Uh, it's a it's a very good visual resource. Osprey books are so helpful uh, to this show. It's really wonderful. We have another Osprey one, The Roman Army from Hadrian to Constantine by Michael Simpkins and Ronald Empleton. Uh, anytime I talk about an Osprey book, the first one's always going to be the author, the second one's the illustrator. Uh, the Early Middle Ages by Yale Courses on their YouTube channel by Dr. Paul Friedman. I really would recommend listening to this one if you're interested in this topic. Only the first two or three episodes really cover the period that we're, uh, we're talking about here. But in those three hours of lectures, you're going to just learn an absolute ton. Uh, he's a very, very engaging uh, professor to listen to. It made me feel like I was back in college, which I always like. And the History of Rome podcast has a really good episode on Aurelian. It doesn't go through the entire third century crisis, but uh, their Aurelian episode is quite good. So before we start, we have some patron questions. If you donate a certain amount, we are able to, you can uh, ask questions directly for lies. This one's from Hercules, and it's Mystery Religions. Your description of the Mystery Religions makes it sound separate from the Roman religion and something that disrupted the Roman religion, except that wasn't really the case, as people could join the Mystery Cults, also pray to Mars for victory in battle, then when they're home, pray to local gods without any issue or complication. Uh, and he talks about in Hellenism, you also have this kind of stuff with the cult of Isis and Serapis. So I think we're talking about cross-purposes a little bit here. It's true that when people are getting into the mystery religions, they're not leaving Roman religion behind, right? This is still part of Roman religion. But just like, for example, uh, you could think about Protestantism in the last 40 years in the United States, where evangelical Protestantism has been just been growing by leaps and bounds, and mainline Protestantism has been suffering as a result in weekly church attendance and uh, the amount of money it takes in to support those churches and things like that. And you can think of something a little bit similar here, where people are putting their time and their energy into the mystery religions and their money, right? You need money to run a big temple. And a lot of these Roman state temples, they take a lot of money, not just to build, but to keep functioning uh, and to pay everyone. So when you start having declining uh, funds coming into the temple, that's that can get you into trouble really quickly. And when you combine that with the fact that the local elites are falling in, in importance and they're falling in the, the amount of money that they make, uh, they're not donating as much either because all the power is resting with these military officers who are just marching around and don't really care about local gods, like whatever, like this is just some stupid town that I'm barracked in for like a couple of years. I'm not going to give it to the temple here. Um, so it's not traditionally like oh, we're not part of Roman religion anymore, we're part of this mystery cult. Uh, it's part of this fragmenting and kind of deterioration of Roman state religion to a certain extent. So it's not like falling down, but it's not in a strong position, and that gives an opening for Christianity. Frank Mitchell has a really good question about Rome without Rome. During the third century crisis, the Roman head of state spent most of his time outside Rome in the field, putting down invasions and rebellions. What effect did this have on civil administration? Did raids, poor harvests, smaller insurrections just fall through the cracks? Did towns and colonies simply fend for themselves? 
What were citizens outside Rome or the latest hotspot doing through all this? So the answer basically is yes. And it changes at what point in the third century crisis we're talking about, right? Because this goes on for quite a long time. Um, but particularly when you start getting those barrack room emperors coming in, or even back to the, the 260s, right? Where the Palmyrian Empire and the Gallic Empire start breaking off. It's because they don't feel served by the central state. Uh, they don't feel like this is, they're really a part of Rome, so why don't we just govern ourselves? Uh, and then you get to Diocletian, who is starting to get things back together, and he has great ideas about like, hey, we're going to separate civil and military administration, so when, like, the officer marches away to put down a rebellion or, you know, deal with border raiders, civil administration in the city doesn't just stop, right? <laughs> like, that's a big problem. Uh, but you also have Diocletian, who does not care about Rome, like, literally does not care. It's even an open question whether he went to Rome at all. And if he did go to Rome, it seems like he got there, got the Senate to declare him emperor, and was basically like, bye, <laughs> like it never came back. And that was partially a message to show the city of Rome, uh, its elite power base, and the senators that he just didn't consider them important or relevant uh, to the running of the state at all. Uh, and this is sort of, a, sort of a sad fate for the imperial city, right? Um, but... Yeah, so that's, there is, there's a lot of stuff falling through the cracks, and that's why uh, these peripheral parts of the empire are starting to break away, because they just don't feel very well served by the government. Episode one, a lot of you wanted to say, can you give us the list of emperors from the song? Yes, I can. Uh, and we'll go through with just a couple of pauses to mention things. Uh, we did mention Maximinus Thrax, uh, Thrax Gordian I, Gordian II. Balbinus and Prupentius, Gordian III, Philip the Arab, Trajan Decius, Hostilian, which is an amazing name that I'm totally going to use in a Black Library novel someday, uh, Trebonianus Gallus, Emilian, Valerian. We're going to stop and pause at Valerian for a second, and I'm going to point out I pulled a little bit of a Lin Manuel Miranda in these lyrics. Uh, I used a story that was so good I couldn't leave it out, but it's a little bit dubious. Uh, there are sources that say that Valerian, after being uh, captured by the Sassanid Persians, was killed by being forced to drink molten gold or was skinned alive. We don't know if this is true, and in fact it is very iffy. Let's just put it that way. The sources that say this are very anti-Persian and they don't all agree. It's possible he just died in captivity. They got, got ill. There is one source that says that, that he saw his flayed skin <laughs> when he visited Persia. But uh, I think it's probably not a thing. But it's a famous enough story, and it's widely believed enough that I was like, yeah, I can just say in lies that that might not have been what happened, but it's going in the song. Gallienus, Claudius II, Quintilus, and Aurelian. So that's, that's them. Uh, I, 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 don't want, I want to do like a poster of the lyrics with like each emperor labeled. We were going to put their names on there, but the way that the art turned out, the way the animation turned out, just there wasn't a lot of room and the, each frame was gonna be too busy. Um, and it's also sort of hard to be listening to one thing and then be reading a completely different thing. Uh, so we decided, unfortunately, that, that we were gonna uh, leave the names out. But uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll figure out something put on a shirt or something. Uh, episode two, we had a great patron question from Daniel Galgano. How truly autonomous or independent was the Gallic Empire from the Roman Empire? Pretty, pretty autonomous. So there's this Roman commander with the amazing name of Posthumus. He declared it independent uh, by and himself emperor in 260. After that, it passed through a couple of hands after he died, ended up with a guy called Tetricus, and that's the Gallic Emperor who Aurelian defeats. Uh, but it's basically a separate state. They're not taking orders from the Western Emperor, and they're minting their own coins and things like that. So, yeah, it's basically independent. It was just a whole breakaway state. Uh, we got told about this amazing story that I didn't include, which involves Aurelian and dogs. Uh, and I'm just going to read directly from the source. When he came to Tyana and found its gates closed against him, he became enraged and exclaimed, it is said, 
In this town, I will not leave even a dog alive. Aurelian, however, with the true spirit of an emperor, at once performed two notable deeds, one of which showed his severity and the other his leniency. For, like a wise victor, he put to death Heraclemon, this is the, the guy who let them into the city, uh, the betrayer of his native place, and when the soldiers clamored for the destruction of the city in accordance with the words in which he had declared that he would not leave a dog alive in Tyana, he answered them, I did indeed declare that I would not leave a dog alive in the city. Well then, kill all the dogs. Uh, notable indeed were the prince's words, but more notable still was that the deed of the soldiers for the entire army, just as though it were gaining riches thereby, took up the prince's jest, by which both booty was denied them and the city preserved intact. And the commenter says, except for the dogs. The dogs were not intact. So this, this is kind of like an interesting story in a couple of ways. One of them being like how loyal the army is to Aurelian, that he would just make this joke about like, oh yeah, I said kill all the dogs, so we're going to keep the city intact, but kill all the dogs, you know. That was the promise I made, ha ha ha, and then they go do it. Um, but it also shows us this really interesting dual nature of Aurelian, of being both merciful and merciless at the same time. Uh, and it leads really handily into the next question. Uh, did Aurelian kill Zenobia in the Triumph? There are a couple of different versions of this. The less, uh, the outliers and the ones that are less well-trusted say that she died on the way to Rome or that she was beheaded in the Triumph. Most sources agree that after the Triumph, she was given a villa uh, to live in with her children. And some say that she actually remarried uh, a Roman nobleman. Tetricus was also spared, and he became a governor in Italy, kind of like a keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer thing. So you have this very strange dichotomy with Aurelian, right, where he will wipe out Palmyra, right, and he will wipe out Tetricus's army. Just like when they were defeated, there were just mass executions. But he's nice to Tetricus, and he's pretty good to Zenobia. <laughs> so it's this very weird dual nature about him. Uh, at one point we said Serbia or the Balkans. What we should have said is Serbia uh, or Bulgaria. Uh, that's that's my mistake. It was a mistake in the script, and I uh, and I didn't catch it on review. Uh, as I've said before, you know I watch this a bunch of time, these episodes a bunch of times to try and find mistakes, and we do find mistakes and we fix them. But sometimes other stuff slips through, or sometimes we fix something and it creates a mistake. Uh, Episode three, we put a star for Trier in France, not Germany. If we had just done a little bit, a little bit that way on the map, it would have been correct. When you don't have the borders on the, uh, the modern day borders on the countries, it can sometimes be a little difficult just like triangulating where on the coast it should go, especially when you get the further inland you get, the more tough it gets. But yeah, we should have noticed that one. A couple of you asked, what about uh, Olpia Severina, the wife of Aurelian? What about her? She sounds really cool. So this is Aurelian's wife. She's Empress of Rome. And we don't know a lot about her. The sources don't mention her, but we have coins with her uh, on them as if she's the emperor. We also have some inscriptions that uh, kind of talk about her having, having, being in charge of the centralized authority. So there is, a pre there is pretty good evidence that she actually was the empress of the United Roman Empire for an interregnum uh, before the next emperor came up. So that's really cool. I wish we could do a one-off, but I looked into it because I went, oh, this is, this is great one-off material. And unfortunately, I don't think there's enough to really sustain a seven to 10 minute episode, but it's very interesting and cool. Episode four, uh, this one is, this was an, is embarrassing. We misspelled Caesar. Uh, I think I mentioned it before. I've a little bit of a pattern recognition issue where sometimes uh, letters are switched around. I don't recognize them or colors on a flag or something like that. Uh, this was a, a, a situation where I asked that text be put on something after it was created. Like when we did our fixes, I, we put text in there. And uh, sometimes when you do that, you have to just sort of like proof it really quick before before it goes out. And I missed this uh, misspelling. Sorry about that. Uh, I. Those mistakes are embarrassing, but I always feel better about them because it's like, okay, but we're not misinforming anyone. Nobody's going to see that. They're going to see that and say like, oh, they misspelled Caesar. Like, uh, it's, but like at least 
you know how Caesar is spelled, and I know how Caesar is spelled, and nobody's gonna, you know, get a wrong idea about history uh, because we misspelled something. I still hate it, though, but, you know, I console myself in whatever way I can. Uh, similarly, we said Spain when we probably should have said the Iberian Peninsula uh, because it's Spain and Portugal. We had, a, uh, we had a comment that was really cool, but I kind of checked it out, and I'm not certain all of it is correct, actually. But uh, someone pointed out that Diocletian also created a military office of an attendant uh, called comis or uh, comitem, which is where we get the word count. That seems to have checked out when I looked into it. However, there was also a comment about that we get the word paladin from... Uh, another office he created that, that was the, uh, the what the Praetorian Guard became when they started guarding the city rather than the emperor. The uh, word paladin looks like it, it's Middle French, and it walks back through Italian to Latin, but it means more like palace official rather than uh, rather than what the Praetorian Guards became. They, it doesn't mean palace guard; it means like palace official, um, or at least that's what I found in my uh, etymological delving. So I might be wrong. Episode 5, there is, it was pointed out, a weird irony to the fact that Diocletian's tomb is now our cathedral. I don't know how I didn't come across this while I was researching. That's an amazing fact. I really love that. I wish I had put it in the episode. Darn. Okay. Uh, that's okay. You can't win them all. We had, we had a very difficult time cutting the things down to length anyway, so it probably would have had to been thrown out and talked about in lies anyway. Uh, a lot of you pointed out, so we said that Judaism was respected uh, by the Roman state. So what about Hadrian? What about the uh, Jewish-Roman wars? So this is a really good question. What about the destruction of the temple? Uh, kind of a big deal, right? You know, diaspora that is still affecting Jewish people today. Uh, so first of all, I would love to do a series on the Jewish-Roman wars. I think they're fascinating. And it one of the reasons that they're so fascinating is you have to get into this like enmeshment of politics and religion and try and tease out what is politics and what is religion. And the Roman Empire had no problem with Judaism as a religion. It was on the list of legal religions. They made a bunch of accommodations about uh, for Judaism in the beginning, like not building in certain areas, uh, minting special coins that could be used that, that didn't have pagan symbols on them, uh, but, you know, that acceptance varies depending on political conditions. And that is the main thing, right? The Roman Empire does not really care who you worship, uh, provided that religion is in line with the state and is not rising up against the state. Uh, and when that starts to happen, they can become very brutal indeed. Uh, so Judaism as a religion was not considered anti-Roman. Uh, and it was respected for being ancient. Uh, but once the once religious authorities uh, start turning against the Roman state, then things become quite different. Uh, and then this with some of the some of the, some of later some later emperors like Hadrian, there is some conflict about things like building on the Temple Mount, right? Um, so there is conflict there, but it's not it's different than the conflict with Christianity. Right? Christianity is seen as antithetical to the Roman state. Right? You can't be a Roman pacifist. There is no such thing as a Roman pacifist. Right? Uh, and it was, you know, it's very easy uh, in Judaism, in ancient Judaism, to identify who is Jewish. Right? Whereas Christianity had this like underground quality and this like subversive, secretive quality that was not liked. Um, so it's, it's different. And were we to do something on the, uh, Jewish Roman Wars, which I would love to do again, uh, we will talk about those intricacies. So coming up on Extra History, we've got so many cool series. Our next series is Cleopatra. I had to take some time off a little bit recently, so it's written by Professor Bob Whitaker, and he's taught Cleopatra, which is actually very neat. Um, and that's, that's just been a series that's been developing for a while, and it's it's done now, and I'm really happy with where we ended up. Uh, I like it a lot. After that, it's one that I've been wanting to do 
forever uh, the end of the samurai. So we're doing the Meiji Restoration, but we're specifically focusing it on the samurai and development of the Imperial Japanese Army and military modernization and all of the bonkers stuff that happens during the Boshin War and the Satsuma Rebellion and just Kyoto turning into a madhouse of political murder with the samurai killing each other in the Shinsengumi, and it's going to be really fun. Uh, it will banish any thoughts you ever had about the Meiji Restoration being a bloodless revolution. It was not. Um, then after that, we just had our vote, and the winner was Saladin. So we're going to talk about Saladin. And I'm, again, the most famous Kurd in history. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a cool thing. Uh, we also have some more medical history stuff coming up that I'm, I can be a little vague about. And our first ever Extra History Halloween episode. I've been waiting years for, for Halloween to fall close enough to a Saturday uh, that we could do a Halloween episode and not have it feel weird. Uh, and I'm very, very much looking forward to it. It's something I've been wanting to do for a while. So finally, let's take Ibn Battuta's side trip, which is where I just kind of like talk about a thing that I wasn't able to fit in the episodes, but I really wanted to. Now, one thing I found really fascinating about the third century crisis is we frequently divide Roman history into like the good emperors and the bad emperors, right? With the idea that Marcus Aurelius is the last really good emperor and everyone after that just like makes everything a mess and destroys uh, everything that was built before. What I like about the third century crisis is it really challenges that. A lot of the problems that Rome has during the third century crisis are not because the so-called bad emperors screwed things up, it's that the good emperors created this empire that was way too big to run and, you know, was inevitably going to start flying apart. Um, and I just, I think that's a, that's a very interesting prospect that, you know, this sort of massive success has a cost. Um, and once you have this enormous empire, it takes a lot to keep all of it up and any kind of uh, slack in maintenance and things just start to deteriorate really quickly. Um, so that's it's just a really good, uh, good lesson. Maybe we'll learn it someday. Don't overextend yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for joining us. I really can't wait for you to see what we've got coming up. Uh, it's been a, been a fun year. We're keeping going. Stay safe, everyone. Did you all know that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Globus, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One were all legendary patrons? Thanks, everyone.